Hello, everybody. This is Captain Sweet Sweep of the Very Secret Plan. And I'm here with Yogi Shambu in Sai, and we're doing a show called The Inside Scoop, where we are bringing to you a totally new way of hearing news and getting a pulse on the fabric of society. And Yogi Shambu and I have very different perspectives. And usually I'm coming from a sort of global uh, political point of view. And Mr. Shambu is coming from an individual health point of view. And we kind of mix in between. And uh, it's like a wizard and, uh, and, a, and, a, and a yogi. And these are two different perspectives. These are, these are very different reference points. But together we give you a broad spectrum of an analysis of what is occurring in society right now. So that said, I'll pass it over to Mr. Yogi Shambu, and uh, we, we, this is a weekly now kind of report, and I'm wondering, what do you got to say? Thank you so much, Elijah. It's true. We do have our different perspectives, but they seem to overlap and mingle as they do, and that's what it seems this, uh, we're hoping that this show is going to be all about. Um, there's always a combination of looking into the outside world and then dealing with your own life. And so I think it's valuable for people to know um, both what we have kind of coming across our radar screen, um, but also some of the difficulties that we're going through uh, navigating this week's waters, because I think that there's a lot of commonality with that. People find community in that. I've been looking a lot on the um, world news front around this idea of COVID-19, this is not the flu. And technically, you're right, this is not the flu, absolutely. But we are looking at uh, the issues of the initial modeling that projected how much death, fatality was going to come from uh, this outbreak, uh, this virus, and the reality that people are finding now. And I think that there is a big difference in that. And why am I looking at that? Because the projected numbers seem so overwhelming to the human mind that that's all that people could think of. And there is a whole lot of a whole lot going on um, as people are locked down and as people are distracted and fixating on this. And so just wanted to look at some of that. Um, but before I get into the specifics, um, just, just want to check in with uh, you and, and how's been your week? It, it's been an up and down time for me. Um, and the biggest thing is, is really managing and being responsible for my uh, energy, mm. but also my relationships. And, uh, you know, we are definitely in university right now trying to maintain relationships in a confined space. Mm. How about you? What's been going on? Well, I think fear is a big reference point in terms of if people are feeling a lot of fear or not feeling a lot of fear. What I see is that the, uh, the time alone is, is a very introspective time. Stopping all that social noise is a very uh, good way of going inside and reflecting. And so I think all human beings right now have, have, have some time to themselves. But like you say, time around a, a smaller group of people, perhaps, or one person that they haven't had that much. And so you're coming across perhaps your fears of being seen and your fears of uh, interacting so much with just a small group and, not, and realizing how much you're missing all the different connections you have in your community and society. And I, I don't think we do well. I think we need to have a lot of stimulation. We need to have a lot of interaction. And uh, the more we have with loved ones on a broad spectrum, the, the more the richer our lives are. And I think what's happening is this is the end game of the freaking nutballs attempting to bring in a new world order. And we are now faced with it. We, we saw the steps along the way, and now we're here. And so what do we do about it? Look at this. We're talking like this, and all across the world, there's all these humans talking. So you can't kind of, we're very call it, uh, resilient in a sense. You know, humans can't, you know, they're searching for meaning. They're searching for purpose. They want to have significance in their lives. 
and the normal corporate government narrative is giving them such a limited viewpoint of society, of, the, of life, of everything, and they're cutting all the doors, they're bringing in this little reality and saying, this is it. And I, I really think that uh, from the point of view of a wizard, this is the time of the wizard and the yogi. This is the time of the people who have knowledge that is different from what is the normal narrative. And we're the ones that have to bring a new way of seeing the world to a world that is kind of uh, stunned by the stupidity of what is occurring, I think. But nobody can kind of say that because everyone has to appear like they really care about the safety and health of everyone. But they've been following the story that actually isn't true and is actually just another scam like all the other scams before. And everyone's falling for it again. And here we are now, socially distant, alone in our houses, going, what is going on? Well, the, that's a, there's some really important points that you're saying to me. And it's that emotional stunned, uh, which follows the intellectual stunned. Because there is this overwhelm that people are feeling. And then there's this, you know, there's a lot of depression, the amount of depression that's going on, the amount of uh, even rates of suicide that are coming up. The effect of the quarantine is, uh, is causing major secondary health effects. We're uh, looking at child uh, molestation. We're looking at um, uh, alcoholism. We're talking about depression, suicide. These things are all going up and they're going up around the globe. And um, we're also looking at the, um, you know, the authoritarian overtaking of, of uh, different places around the world. And in, in like this week, we're, you know, the hotbeds of that authoritarian dictatorship would be in Hungary. You know, you see um, the leader of Hungary is actually now, uh, they basically have shut down the parliament. They have suspended any uh, chance of elections until further notice. They're in a state of emergency until, you know, for the foreseeable future. Uh, and then he can dictate by decree, which means that there's no one else that is able to chime in. He's just doing this. And so this is, this is the beginning of things, uh, you know, and we reported last week about this as well. Now in El Salvador, they're doing the same thing, right? We're looking at, um, you know, truly, uh, you know, authoritarian control of the masses and why, because they are enforcing the public health um, you know, policies that are in place. You know, uh, Ontario and Quebec have asked and the federal government has allowed the deployment of military forces now to, um, yeah, to really reinforce this, um, you know, these, these measures, because people are starting to relax. They're starting to look at the lethality rate. I mean, if we, if we look at the lethality rate of, you know, the flu, so the biggest catchphrase that I've heard is, you know, this is not the flu, this is not the flu. And, you know, you're saying the worst thing in the world trying to normalize this with any other infection that sweeps across the planet every year. But actually, the models that the World Health Organization had said that three in a hundred people were going to die from the COVID-19. And so that was enough to make every government, every person around the world say, my God, we have to stop that. But actually, we're looking at numbers that are numbers that are right, one, maybe two in a thousand. And so that, that is, you know, 10 times less. You know, this is far different than what we're talking about. So just a second, the, the screen froze just as you were speaking. So you said two in a thousand, is that? Yeah, one, uh, between one and two. So like 1.5 and a thousand people will die. Um, and now that is, 
uh, we're talking about cases where people are uh, coming into uh, the, the, the medical system um, and we don't know how low we could drive that if they had preventative measures, if they were you know, on very strict health regimes that are completely ignored. You know, we're talking in the world of what is conspiracy, what is, you know, um, what is going on under the surface that is leading to all of this. We have no mention besides cleaning your hands of any preventative measures. We know that the flu can be prevented uh, or mitigated by you know, natural antibiotic, by raising the immune system. And so that's just some of the things that are coming through my mind at this time. You know, it's impossible to contact trace this. You, you can't do this virus like other viruses. You start to know. About 30, 40, 50% of the population most likely have this and it's going to grow. It's going to grow. So what can you do at that point? And uh, in my opinion, it's about herd immunity um, and doing that in a safe manner where you can start to open things back up. Now, I'm of two minds because I don't, I actually like humans out of the way of the planet because of how much healing the planet is already doing like thank god the kids are away now i can do my own thing again yeah yeah and so it's i'm of two minds about that but i think it's very important to get our minds back in the game um so what have you been have you been looking at this? Have you been thinking about this? What's been go going on with uh, you? I saw some some posts about Michigan and some crazy policies coming down the pipeline trying to control the spread. Well, do you, do you know what it reminds me? It reminds me of uh, Nelson. And Nelson, I, in, in BC, they, supposedly there's a couple of guys that are playing chess outside and they got into a fight. And so they banned chess playing, you know, from, from Main Street or you know, Nelson. And, and it's just, you know, it's kind of cause effect relationship intelligence and wondering, you know, are they really attempting to help our safety and our, you know, health if everyone's indoors, you know, without food <laughs> around, people are going to try to kill you. I, I, I'm not so sure about that. I, I just like the... There's so many things that don't add up. And when you see some of these memes where you see a guy like, you know, in the sand, not surrounded by you know, 100 feet by anybody and the cops arresting him for being there or for hearing about some guy playing basketball by himself and again, you know, getting some $700 fine. You know, it's, it's, it's like, I keep going back to 9-11. It's like if, if the next day after 9-11, I sent this email out saying you know, this was a scam and this is what's going on. and and in the height of the crisis, you cannot get through to people that are, 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 are used to this kind of conditioned state. You can't kind of tell them the truth. And so what I've seen in what's going on now, it's, it's so obviously another, whether false flag or it's another step in the program of, of the new world order. And it, it, you can tell when all of the corporate media has got the same story over and over. And every other story goes, and like, and no one questions, well, there was millions of people in Hong Kong in the streets. And now because of this, they're gone. Uh, and it happened to start in China, uh, where is the start of the 5G network. Uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the natural connections that an investigative journalist would make that is looking for the truth is never made. You know, you, <laughs> you've got these network uh, mentalities that just, they get the story, they broadcast the story, the story came from somewhere, and the story's going, you know, throughout all of the networks. And the human mindset just kind of goes along with it because uh, people want to jump on the bandwagon and be the heroes and protect the planet from what's occurring, but they don't realize that they are actually 
uh, carrying out the higher plans of people that have very nefarious means in their in their minds. So we always have marketing a war, and how you market a war is that you elicit some type of moral response. And this is the perfect moral uh, weapon mm. is concern, is concern for the elderly. You know, so we're talking about, you know, that last week about how, you know, if they really cared about the elderly, they would have actually fed the systems that are supporting them 365 days a year. Mm. And, you know, we're, we're seeing the end result of neo liberalism and how it has drained the system that is actually supposed to support these people so the audacity for them to get say you know well this is how it, you know you can protect your grandparents yes we have to shield you know the elderly and the immune suppressed absolutely but that's what a quarantine is. You quarantine the elderly, you quarantine the vulnerable, you quarantine the sick. You know, you don't quarantine the, um, you know, the healthy mass, right? And so I think you're right is that uh, there is a fixation from the media on the hot spots, and, you know, and what's happening in New, in New York is, uh, of course, any human that is still a human would just, you know, cry and cry over the overwhelm that is going on. The, you know, the end result of this broken system trying to relate to this, absolutely. But it's not innately wrong to look at what else is stressing the immune system at the time of the outbreak. So regardless of what you think about virus and, and is it, you know, is this really a contagious thing or what have you go, going down that rabbit hole, we can look at if 5G rolled out and it takes six months, they say, to really have the body feel the stress of that. And then, so you have a whole population that are under an unprecedented amount of stress from this new technology. And then you have a virus coming in and hitting them. Doesn't that make sense that it's not this or that, but it could be this and that. Yeah. But people seem to be offended by people trying to uh, bring complexity into a conversation. And that's what I hear you doing is asking, let's make this conversation more nuanced. There's more factors than just one, but that's what the mainstream really relies on is fixating on one thing and then having this, this or that and pitting them against each other. Yeah. And I see that with our left leaning friends you know is that now they're starting to argue well you know we'll don't talk about 5g right now because we're in a pandemic da, 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 da. And it's like <laughs> this is a time and we have time we're in quarantine we yeah. can deal with more than one line of reasoning adding to a situation i know but i guess what's a bit strange is like the, the my roommate has a t television and, and sometimes I, I go in there and the news is on and i watch you know, the news, and it's, it's so different from my stream. I mean, my source of information, granted, you know, maybe under the umbrella of conspiracy theorists, but I would call them like truth finders. Uh, but the, the type of, I guess, bias I have is, is <laughs> what they call it confirmation bias. And I feel, well, they're trying to, you know, scam us again. So I've got confirmation bias. I'm looking for where is the scam because it's always there at some point. You kind of go, oh my God, I didn't realize it, but oh, yep, they're lying again. And, you know, it's again, it's like the weapons of mass destruction where like the, they're in this constant cycle of they come up with the crisis and then they, they lie it through their teeth and then they do their hideous things. And then after saying, oh, well, we, you know, that we were, I don't know how that happened, I guess, you know, weapons of mass deception weren't there 
I don't know, you know, we just took out the country and now we go into the next thing, right? And, and this is all part of the same thing. And, and, you know, the United States is a strange country because it, the majority of the people still kind of believe certain things. But one thing they believe is, is they believe they're the good guys. Hmm. You know, they, they don't kind of realize, you know, the stats of, okay, well, you've got more military than the top 10 countries of everybody else. And you haven't, you know, you've had about two wars of two years of peace in 150 years, and you're the guys invading everyone. But you make these great movies. And, and, and in the movies, you know, you're the good guys, you know, helping somebody out. But, you know, movie after movie at some point, like the other countries are going like, you know, we're a little tired of you like blowing people up and taking things over and coming up with these lies that, that say you're allowed to. And that's, and that's something about the memory of the Americans where, you know, I, I know like every country has different groups of people, like demographics, they have ages, they have, you know, mindsets. And so there's certain mindsets and certain generations that sort of interpret reality in different ways. But the younger people all across the world, I think, you know, they're, they're a lot more awake and aware. And so there's this age discrepancy between the youngers who sort of figure it out that those guys are freaking crazy and they're the ones starting all the wars and they're in charge and they're doing their shit. And my older generation just go along with it. Younger people go, no way, man, we don't want that. But they're, they're not in a position like our generation or an older generation to have enough kind of shit hits you that you, you're tired of it. You know why it's happening. And you want to do something about it. So to me, the generations have to get together, share their knowledge. Uh, the generation, you know, the younger generations have the energy and the numbers and the, and, the, and, the, and the sort of the strong emotional feelings around things. And the older generations just have a little bit more wisdom around where and how to organize together. But in general, they're not coming together. They're separated, just like everyone's alone in a park in the city. Like, we're separated. We have to come back together. And one of the things I wanted to talk to you about was a new form of communication within chat rooms. Like if you look at, you watch a video and there's a chat room, and there's like a thousand people in that chat room. And they're, each one is saying something, but there's no discussion. There's no real understanding. The, the chat is not taking you somewhere. And online chatting has become this, this kind of continual spiral of exhausted energy where everyone feels depleted and not empowered so to me we need smaller groups that have a longer existence that have organization and that have facilitators that take groups through a process of deeper understanding of how to work together a deeper understanding about what's going on inside of themselves and a deeper understanding as to how they're going to achieve certain goals amongst with all these other groups around the world that are starting to self-organize outside the goal paradigm. And, th and this is a movement that won't be talked about. And that's why like in a place like here, the people that are interested are gonna be a much smaller number of people, but they're gonna be conscious, they're gonna be aware, they're gonna be looking for others that are conscious and aware. And right now, I think what's happening is there's, there's, there's a large, intense effort on the people that feel separated to feel connected with those of like mind. And so to do so, you have to organize your internet communication system to take into account all of the different groups, give them a place to meet and talk and, and, and really hone what they want to do, but then have like other groups where all the diverse elements are coming together. And here you can have conflict, here you can have argument, but this, this is the richness of a community finally coming to some sort of unity around where they want to proceed together. And this happens in a, in a process that has intelligent design. So what I want to show you is, is the beginning of that, if you would like to see it. Mm -hmm. Well, it's been definitely very sobering. Uh, and it, it's always hard to stay awake to uh, when Facebook and its abuses towards us can be really compared to a, um, an abusive parent. It's so hard to register the abuse of your parent because the ramifications 
of having um, the only source of nourishment that you know of, that you're relying on solely being abusive, that's just an overwhelming thing. And that's exactly what's happening here. During this uh, COVID crisis, we have, um, we have Facebook uh, blocking you from liking a post if that post is against their ideas of what should be propagated right now. And so you're just about to, you know, you, you click like and they flash up a warning saying, you know, this is against our community policy. Uh, you know, this is not what the World Health Organization is saying. No. And so we're talking about such, hopefully it's the most flagrant thing. You know, I thought off, uh, off Facebook activity was the most flagrant thing that Facebook could do where they actually are tracking all of your web uh, searches, all of your locations um, when you're off of Facebook. But no, that didn't seem to even, you know, cause a ripple in people's uh, awareness. So, but hopefully something like this. So if you're, I'm really excited because this platform that you're rolling out gives us the opportunity to not only organize all of that, just the diffuse threads of, of conversation and interest and rabbit holes that people go down late at night and organize it into actually, yeah, in a great way. Let's see how it's organized and please give us a little tour on uh, what's been happening now with the, the second stage of the development. Okay, so it looks like we can't uh, get into that right now. Next week, we'll have to jump in. Uh, mm, please. No, go ahead. I'm... I think it's really exciting that you are developing a way that people can find a productive road through their uh, online experience. Um, how many studies have to be done before we realize that you can come on to social media with uh, an a expectation. And so you have all this dopamine. I am expecting, you know, I'm expecting to see all these likes, people liking what I generated, and then I'm gonna see a couple of great little videos, and I'm gonna feel informed, I'm gonna feel connected, and then I'm gonna go off, you know, and do my life. But that's not the case. People's actual experiences are after, if they spend more than 10 minutes, the amount of depression and isolation and, and self-judgment that they feel, it's just happening time and time and time again. You have people that are fixating, but fixating on something that is so not productive. So that's what I'm excited about is that you are wanting to create an interface that will help people walk through this environment that it, that's fraught with danger and actually have them connecting with people that uh, they feel stimulated by, supported by, and that actually they can act with in a real way. So it's it, the most important thing to me and how I judge a positive online experience is that if it transfers to real life in a productive fashion. And that's what I, I am hoping with the um, Planetary Guardians website system is to be able to uh, actually get online so that then I can actually make my real life more supported, more community oriented, and actually make a change. Hmm. Yeah. Well, if we, if we look at, I guess, what's happening with our species in a sense where, like here, I can have the type of conversation I want with you through Zoom. And honestly, there aren't a lot of people that I want to talk to that are sort of in the same space I'm at, right? If I go out on the street, if I go to the coffee shop, if I go out in normal social situations, I, I'm not, it's going to be rare to meet someone or 
cool to meet someone to have a, a sort of chat with, right? So online has, has become so much more stimulating for people. And whether it's in games or whether it's in social media, we're, we're getting a lot more connection in a sense through this arbitrary methodology that doesn't involve physical space with people. So it's more of a mental space that we're entering into. And what I have been, I guess, working on is looking at the distinction between conversations and looking that a negotiation is very different from an investigation, which is very different from a welcoming, which is very different from a first contact, which is very different from an analysis. And as you know, I have a card set of 72 conversation types. Now I've known that once it was taken into software, that's where the real value was because in general, human beings they don't seem to really want to put a lot of time and effort into restructuring their mind to change the way they communicate or to track the patterns that other people have continually so that perhaps they can change the nature of how we discuss life. And so let's say this here between me and you, I mean, we, we might even call, let's just say an analysis. We're doing an analysis of society. And so the conversation type for the whole thing is this analysis. <laughs> but sometimes a conversational can kill or a distraction can come in, right? There, there are things that stop that conversation from, from going somewhere. And you may be in a, a storytelling or you may be in a, um, a synthesis in your own methodology of talking and we don't know this there's no bar at the top that is saying you're a storytelling right now and I'm in an analysis but that's what I'm leading to I'm leading to becoming more conscious of the type of communication we're in and what types of conversations we need to go through a process to achieve a goal as a group so that the tools are going to be put in a game-like, mission-like, um, foundational structure where teams of, of people are going to learn how to make media, learn how to follow an issue, learn how to use these tools, which are free to us all right now, to create an independent, you know, for the people media network where pretty much almost anybody could join and start to participate in something that actually could create a lifestyle for the meaning we're going to get paid. Like this is a business system. It's not just, you know, for nothing. It's like they get paid. Why can't we be paid? You know, I mean, if, if we're giving information that people are watching that it's useful, it's changing their lives. You know, I think we should all get a reward for that. And uh, so within this game, there's going to be a way for like uh, facilitators, teachers, and originators to make a living. And, uh, I'm excited. I'm very excited. Such, such a reason to be excited. And distinguishments uh, are really kind of change. Uh, the fact that you can distinguish the modes in which you are functioning has always been probably the most exciting part of uh, your system for me when I've been using it because then. I know how to improve something when I know what I'm doing, you know, when I actually know the mode that I'm in and, uh, and people uh, get very disappointed with the results of their actions when those actions are not very well defined uh, because, you know, you're kind of getting a greeting and you're kind of getting an investigation and you're kind of getting a negotiation and everything starts getting, you know, it's a traffic jam of agendas. And, uh, and so to get your agenda straight, you know, so much of my work as a yogi is, is giving my soul the opportunity to respond to my clear programming. But I have to give my soul the opportunity to interact with a clear program and then see what the soul can do. Because we expect so much of ourself, but yet we don't expect enough of ourselves. 
in as much as if we expected more of ourselves in the planning and the clarifying and the implementing of clear instructions, then we could actually expect more of our soul. We could expect more of our body, our mind to be able to respond very well. It's a whole army waiting for the, for the leaders to give clear directive. And, and right now, we have so many mixed directives. No wonder the mind is split in so many directions. And so that's what I'm excited about is, is if, the, um, you know, if your system can actually help people clarify their directives, then we have a chance of having exceptional living. And then people can ex expect more from their life. Yeah. So that's that's really amazing. Well, you, you're bringing up, I think, a really important point that rarely gets brought up on news networks or other things. And that's, you know, what is the relationship between the soul and the mind? And I, I would just like to quickly ask you, and then I'll answer your question. What, what is the relationship between the soul and the mind? I think that would, that would be good to clarify. I think that the soul is a life force that um, that inhabits us, that fuels us, that ultimately gives life to everything. So it gives life to thoughts. It gives life to feelings. You know, it gives life to the metabolic responses. You know, if a soul leaves the body, no matter how well that body is functioning, it starts to recede. It starts to shut down. And why? Because the spirit that's inhabiting it is no longer there. So there's no longer a magnetic reason or there's no longer an inspiration for that metabolic rate, for those thoughts, for those feelings to be, to be generated. And so that's what I feel is, uh, you know, the role of the, uh, of the soul is uh, that it, it's not only the reason, it provides the reason for living, the reason for thinking. But at the same time, it becomes filled and affected by the thoughts. So even though the thoughts are reliant on the soul, the soul actually become reliant on the thoughts because it starts to, to shape shift and it starts to really manifest whatever the mind is putting out there. Wow. I, this type of investigation to me is, uh, I think at the core of a lot of spiritual seeking and finding the relationship between these higher ended words that are referring to something which maybe those words aren't exactly describing that well. And I think the relationship between the soul and the mind is, is, is part of that because every worldview has a very distinct kind of difference in how they're interpreting that relationship or even if they use those words. And, and I would say that I, a lot of my attention has been put on the mind because most of these spiritual masters I was studying were, were pointing to the mind pointing to the sleep like nature of human beings and how easy it is to get caught in the patterns and then to think that the patterns or the programs are you when in fact there's an essence inside of you that might be called the soul or maybe it's part of the soul that is present observing but the mind is so busy the mind is ever busy to seek and to figure and to that the, the frequency gets to a point where the soul is just like not even interested and so to me the mind needs to be controlled and is controlled by taking control of the design of your conceptual frameworks and actually designing your inner blueprints and then the mind all of a sudden is kind of organized in a manner that makes sense. Like there's congruity, there's alignment. You, you understand the relationship between your values and your goals. You understand what you believe. You understand how these beliefs are connected into your overall framework of your purpose. And if you haven't taken the time to do this, you're generally under the spell of the conditioned mind the indoctrination of the government kind of educational system we all grew up in. And so 
I think a big part of you know looking at reality and looking at the 5G and looking at the viruses is we have to decide whether we agree that there actually is some sort of negative force or freaking nutball or group of people that are essentially at war with the people. And if we don't take that into account and we just think, oh no, this is just the way it is and things happen randomly and there is no design, you approach the problem very differently. Like if someone is actually trying to kill you, Mr. Shambu, and coming at your house with a shotgun, you are going to be different inside that house than there's a maybe possible chance that someone walking down the street may one day come into your house and, and shoot you. You know, there's a very big difference. And right now, there are things occurring, which it's, it's like an attack on all of us, but it's being hidden by supposedly trying to protect this. So I, 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 I know I'm on the sort of fringe of the conspiracy curve, but you must know people that are starting to look at things a bit differently that perhaps were, were, uh, were not a few weeks ago, a few months ago. Absolutely. And I think it's very easy to say, um, you know, you are a conspiracy theorist and have this, you are, you know, you are putting this, pulling this information together to generate this idea. To, and the basic idea is, is that there is a controlling force, a group that want to control more. <clears throat> and so that is oftentimes the line of logic. It is basically to push away and to mitigate what you're saying in a diminutive fashion until you have a personal touch with that control yourself until you have a corporate interest coming into your town taking your water or insisting on an industry that is killing your friends and family and then suddenly you see the same people standing up and going you know what there is a force against us and they are pushing their agenda for their own benefit and they don't give a shit about me. And so suddenly the way that they are relating to what you're saying is completely different, but it really is dependent on personal experience. And if there's anything that I hope comes out of this, it, uh, this whole COVID thing is that people's lives are, being affected by this. We see small businesses everywhere is shutting down and a good number of them may never come back. And what are they being replaced with? Large industry. And these people are seeing that. Now, if people can stay awake, there's a principle in spirituality that you can have a temporary awakening, but there's always that chance of people falling back asleep. And so I'm hoping that um, people start framing this as a possible and let's look into this. And of course, there are forces, the 1% who are actively making their end game very well known and they're making it happen. Now, how, how that happens, you could say that's by chance. You could say it's opportunism. You could say it's pre-designed. It doesn't matter. You have to look at, is the end game being achieved? And it is being achieved. We have centralization of currency. We have centralization of, of monitoring <clears throat> of industry, all of those things. And so it, um, as you know, you, you can say what you will about David Icke, but he did say something really interesting a couple of weeks ago that if you know the end game, you can track the steps of how they got there. Yeah. And so I say that there's a lot of people right now that are actually um, quietly conspiracy curious. And that's really heartening to me. Well, I think we're probably coming to the end. I would like, yes. to, I think next week I will have that prototype to show you. And 
for anyone watching, like if you feel like a planetary guardian, if you feel like you want to become involved, you can contact uh, Yogi Shambu or myself. And uh, we're starting to, to collect media teams, start to get people uh, together to, again, build, your, build our own media and to basically take control over our future. I don't think I want to wait for uh, the actual forces that are oppressing us to actually come to our rescue. They may give some bailouts, they may give some money, but lead me down the road, just like the First Nations people found out, whatever trinkets and whatever money they got, it had nothing in comparison with the value of the land they gave up. And for us, it's, it's more of our psychic space. The last remaining you know, land or space is inside of us. It's where our attention is. It's, it's for the, the will of the people. And if we don't stand up now, I, I don't think we're going to have a chance in five years. I think their end game is now and people are going to rise up and change it or we'll just become a bunch of lemmings. And uh, I don't want to leave that to the next few generations. I can use my remaining time to uh, aim as much freedom as possible for as many people. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Elijah. Uh, so many wonderful uh, points have been raised here. And I just really want to leave people with the fact that the urgency is now, as, as Elijah is saying, that uh, we must prove that we trust nature. We trust the process of immunity, that we understand in context the way that we have survived this long on this planet is through the natural intaking and sharing of viruses and bacteria and that these things build strength and that yes, people do die and there is a, a, there's a of course a sadness to that, but that we have to look at it in relation to everything else that is going on that is killing us as people every year and actually ask, is this disproportionate to uh, the other illnesses? And is this worth shutting down the whole world and not knowing when and how it's going to restart? So thank you so much, Elijah, and looking forward to, uh, yeah, ne next time. Right. Bye, Yogi. Have a great day. Thanks. Bye.